I'm late, I'm late, oh god, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. okay, okay, okay. <sighs> Made it, got there. <laughs> um, welcome everybody to History with the Bard. We got started a little late again, or a little late today, I apologize for this. A uh, little bit of a, little, little bit of a delay there, um, been a day, but, uh, you know, welcome back, I'm your host Creepy Bard. Um, I know last week... I said we would be covering, what did I say, I said, oh, we'd be diving back into Romance of the Three Kings, specifically Chapter 5. Um, that is not happening tonight. Sorry for anybody who is excited for that. Um, it boils down to the fact that I just, uh, I don't know how to put this. It boils down to the fact that I was in my Buddhism class the other day, uh, yesterday specifically, and a lot of people were asking um, about China's relationship with Mongolia and why China doesn't have the rosiest view of Tibetan Buddhism. And believe it or not, those things are related. And I offered to do a show on that. So I am doing this, you know, for class, but not for a grade or anything, just for kicks. Um... So that's why we're here today. That's why we're talking about Mongolia instead of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, even though we will still be playing Dynasty Warriors, because fuck you, Dynasty Warriors is awesome. Um, I don't need anything from you. I was going to update some stuff. Uh, let's see here. So, yeah, because of that, we're going to do just a general overview of China's relationship with Mongolia sort of as a whole. Um... No, that's not what I wanted. That is, though. And then... All the buttons are weird for this. I guess I'll put it into the... That one? That's that's fine. Um, sorry, I've been playing another game that uses the controller, and it was weird. Does things differently. Okay, so that's already done. This is <coughs> Anywho. <coughs> Fuck. Um... We need allies right now. So, a lot of people don't really know any, or don't really have any idea about what China's relationship with Mongolia actually is. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, don't understand some of the things that are going on in Chinese culture and Chinese, like just the Chinese uh, everything right now, I guess. So, you know, figured I'd cover some of this. Um, if you know how the Tibet situation's been going, then, which, if you don't, I'm surprised. I don't know how you've managed to avoid it. Um, but if you know how the Tibet situation's going, you know that China does not handle its... Um, I don't want to say predecessors. I want to say neighbors very well. Um, the same thing with Taiwan. The same thing with pretty much everywhere that has ever been a place where the Chinese are. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, fuck that guy in his face. Oh shit, they just straight up murdered him. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, other reasons why we're going to be covering this tonight. Um, it's actually pretty relevant to the research I'm doing. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, I'm doing research on Romance of the Three Kingdoms and the religious and philosophical implications found within the book. And one of the implications that I argue about is the book subtly, ha or the main text that most people know about handling Buddhism in a very negative way. Um, they basically, uh, Lu Guangzhong's version of the text handles Buddhism very quietly, but also basically just assuming that it is the worst thing ever and causes all of the problems for everyone involved ever. Um, and then another reason why we're talking about it is because I fucking want to. You can't stop me. Um, but you know, whatever. So, yeah. Moving on. So, to understand China's past relationship with Mongolia, you kind of have to understand how China views itself. 
Um, which is to say that they have the highest opinion of themselves. Uh, higher than most countries have ever had. I would argue that it's probably one of the most uh, arrogant, uh, self-centered... I don't have a good word for it. None of those really feel appropriate. Um, but they definitely have a superiority complex going on. Um, China has always had this opinion of itself that it is the center of the universe, so to speak. Um, in fact, the actual name of China, you know, in Chinese, is Zhongguo, which translates to either the middle or the central state. Uh, what is it the middle of? What is it the center of? Well, fucking everything, as it turns out. And this viewpoint that they've had with themselves has really kind of soured their relationships with countries throughout history, not just Mongolia. It has also been a point of contention with the UK. It was a point of contention with Japan. It's a point of con er, It's been a point of contention with everybody, honestly, all the time, forever. Um, the only people that wasn't was the Manchus, and that's because, you know, the Manchus took over for them for a little while. It's a whole thing. Um, and then they got racist again, so China doesn't have a whole... Ch ch okay, more specifically, it's not just, like, China as a whole. China as a whole actually has a lot of different ethnicities all grown up and hanging out in the same giant melting pot. Uh, probably more... more competing ethnic... or more different... Uh, uh, I don't want to say this. There are probably more uh, I guess I have to say different. Uh, there are more different I would almost argue I won't say it specifically because I don't actually know, but I would argue that there are more competing um, you know uh, competing ethnicities within China than there are in America and all things considered that's I understand it's a bold claim, but they have a lot. Um, so when I say that China has a very hu very high opinion of themselves, what I really mean is the Han have a high opinion of themselves, which isn't a bad thing per se. Um, but it's like I've said, it led it's led to some really interesting uh, and really bad <laughs> situations in the past. Um, China's opinion of themselves it can be argued, is wholly responsible, well, largely, I won't say wholly, but it is largely responsible for the Opium Wars. Um, it's not responsible for the Sino-Japanese War, but it's very likely that it was a major factor in losing the Sino-Japanese War. Um, and there's just a whole lot to unpack there that, one, we don't really have time to do right now. And two, uh, we're not talking about China's opinion of itself for the whole time. We're talking about how that opinion, how they sort of view the rest of the world. And like I said, it's important to understand that the way they view the rest of the world is everybody sucks, we're the best. The second thing we need to know, understanding China and Mongolia's opinions of each other. I would say Mongolia's opinion, but everything I can find so far basically says that the Mongolians don't give a shit. Um, they just kind of are there. They just hang out, as far as I can tell. Um, I haven't done extensive research, unfortunately, because, let's be honest, I really don't... Like, you guys, if you've watched this show enough, you know, I don't care about modern opinions very much. Um, those exit... Found medicine, what is this for? Oh, shit! Well, I should do that, then. Um, yeah, I don't pay attention to modern events, I don't pay attention to modern opinions, all of that is outside of my purview as far as I'm concerned, no, um, which is why I haven't done a whole lot of research into that, and why I probably won't. I'll look into it a little bit if anybody asks, but until, until we get to a point where, uh, you know, it becomes relevant for my research, I'm generally not going to pay attention to it. Um, so... Next, uh, so we have to understand Mongolia, like, I would say Mongolia's, but we don't need Mongolia's, because, as far as I can tell, they just don't have one. Uh, Mongolians are a proud people with a very 
rich history. Um, but as far as I can tell, they they did their thing, and now they're kind of done with it. Um, they've had a long time to get over that, and I think I don't know for certain, but I'd say World War II probably helped to take Chinese ire away from Mongolia at least a little bit. Um, I'll actually be doing research here in a minute in the middle of this show just to verify some of that because I am actually interested in in how that particular situation is turning out. Um, but as of this exact second, I don't know. So we got to understand where they've come from. And if you've paid attention to this show at all, you know I'm about to whip out my Yuan Dynasty bullshit. I like the Yuan Dynasty. Those guys were awesome. They were metal and really weirdly just liberal about everything. I don't get it personally, but hey, if it works, it works. Um, but yeah, so the, we got to talk about the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty, for those of you who aren't aware, is the Mongol Dynasty of China. Um, it is what the Mongolians decided to call their, their empire, namely, it's what Kublai Khan, I think? I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it was Kublai. Uh, it's what Kublai decided that they would call themselves. Um, fun fact, it's actually the name of the currency of China right now. It's the Yuan. Um, and it's a, t it's, a, it's a surname that's used a lot um, in... For in China, uh, it's not like the most common surname, but it's it's relatively common. It pops up throughout history. Um, what am I looking for here? I don't know what I'm looking for here. Whatever. Um, but yeah, it pops up a lot throughout history. It's of relative. It's of relative interest, but it's not technically itself important. Um, but yeah, so the Yuan Dynasty is the Mongols invading China and basically setting up shop. Uh, they did pretty well for themselves right up until the end of the... Th I want to say 14th, but I think it was 13th. I'm going to go with 14th. Uh, they did pretty well for themselves right up until the end of the 14th century uh, when... Qing, I want to say? I think it's the Qing. Uh, the Qing, you know, threw everybody out. Uh, got rid of them, and... China became its own country once again. They had a fervor in... Ugh, sorry, I was interrupted there. Anyway, um, they had a bit of a fervor in rooting out, uh, you know, Mongolian influences, Mongolian issues, Mongolian everything. Um, they basically demonized anything and everything that was even remotely related to the Mongolians, which, coincidentally, brings us to Tibet. Now, I, according to some sources that I've, I've looked into, from what I can tell, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is actually... Not 100% Mongolia's fault, but the Dalai Lama and their sort of chain of command sort of come from Mongolia. And uh, as of, it wasn't Timur, it was, I think it started with an A. Not the son of Kublai Khan, but I think his son um, adopted it as sort of the official religion of the Mongolian Empire for a time. And what the fuck is happening here? Whatever, I'm just going to start killing things. Um, but yeah, it became sort of the key religion of the Mongolian Empire for a while. Um, and, you know, it was fairly important. Oh, i got to make sure somebody reaches the... Okay, that's fine. Um, and it was, the, it was the important religion of the area at the time. Um, I don't know how the Empire sort of handled that situation. Um, I haven't looked into how they treated other religions during that time frame. As of Kublai Khan, uh, the Mongolian Empire handled other religions very well. They just said, hey, look, 
you have a religion, we have a religion, everybody's got religion, so just don't be a dick to each other and we'll be fine. You know, you know, and still you can pay homage to to your Mongolian masters as you do. Um, and for the most part they were pretty they were pretty okay with uh, most people's. Um, during Kublai Khan's time, they certainly had everything. He had he sent for Christ or Catholics. He sent for Muslims. He sent for Buddhists and indigenous religions. Just all kinds of things. Um, and you know, because of that, he was he was fairly liberal with religions. But I don't know how it was handled after that fact. Um, I have to assume that there was a certain amount of disparity between uh, between other cultures at that point because they officially had a religion um, before Mongolia or before Tibetan Buddhism uh, was sort of adopted as Mongolia's main thing. Um, there was a time frame where they worshipped a certain animist religion, um, which is the Religion you'll find in the Marco Polo Net Netflix series, um, if you watch that at all. It's the Great Blue Sky. It's an animist religion focusing on shamanism and things like that. Um, you know, the usual thing that pagan religions tended to be. Uh, I'm sure it had differences from other religions, but I haven't taken a chance to look. That's on my to-do list, so to speak. Um... So, Mongolia adopts this as their state religion for a while, uh, un until their fall, I think, in fact. Um, and once they fall, Confucianism is reinstated, and Mong or Buddhism is just kind of shit on. Just all the time. All the time, forever. Just shit on. Um, but, Tibet was its own separate country for a while, so it was able to maintain its religion for a time. Um... And then China went ahead and took Tibet by force, caused all those problems, and now it's all a clusterfuck. Um, current Mongolian Chinese relations right now. Let's do a little bit of looking into that. Um, this is just going to be a quick, like Wikipedia, check a couple of sources, search, but. Actually, I'll just... There we go. Um... Bilateral relations between Mongolia and the People's Republic of China. Long-term religion... Uh, Long-term determined by the relations between China and the Soviet Union. Mongolia's other neighbor and main ally until... 1990, according to Wikipedia, price between USSR and China in the late 1980s, Sino-Mongolian, oh, that's an S, oh, well, relations also began to improve. Since the 90s, Mongolia is China's biggest trade partner, and a number of Chinese businesses are operating in Mongolia. That's interesting. Okay, so I started this, this uh, talk with the idea that Mongolian relations with China would be hard-pressed. Because, as I stated earlier, uh, Chinese relations or re Mongolia had conquered the area for a time, and uh, you know that was all a thing. Um, the thing that I ignored because I didn't even think about it because, well, it's me. I don't exactly pay attention to things that are outside of a certain time frame, namely after the 14, 1500s. Um, what happened was the USSR happened. Uh, the USSR and China being bros kind of apparently healed that wound up. This is according to History of Baron Ungern. This is... which reference is this for? Um, and all its independence. 1921, Chinese forces driven out by white Russian forces led by Baron... Okay. Uh, China-Mongolia boundary... Alright, so these, this first part about China... And Mongolia having decent relations since the fall of the USSR. Um, or since the rapprochement between the USSR and China. Uh, since the 90s. Okay. So this part 
the part that I stated earlier, that they have decent relations right now, there's no source for this. This is just a stated fact at the beginning of the page. Um, everything else, though, is pretty heavily sourced. Uh, China, biggest trade partner and source of foreign investment. Source 5. Uh, this is Jamestown Foundation as of 2005. Uh, that research is no longer up. That's annoying. China breathes new life. Asia Times. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't trust the site like at all. So, after checking the sources for this, I don't see a whole lot that I trust. Oh, there's one from the Library of Congress. We'll just check that real quick. Uh, that's a... Since 1984, improvement in Mongolian relations China has lagged behind the more rapid advances in the Soviet. Um, 1984, 86. So it looks like as of the 80s, according to uh, the Library of Congress, it looks like as of the 80s, things were a little rocky. And then, starting at about 89, um, the Sino-Soviet summit, key subjects for the drug minister for uh, Sino-Soviet relations. Showing significant improvement in normalization between... Okay. So, yes. Because Mongolia was a very staunch supporter of the USSR for the longest time, and then once the USSR patched relations with China, China and Mongolia saw improved relations. Um, I'm curious to see, actually, how they're handling it now, because the USSR is disbanded. So... Okay, it looks like from a couple of different sites here, just skimming over their, you know, blurbs, uh, it looks like... Oh, that's interesting. Um, it looks like, for the most part, Chinese relations with Mongolia are pretty strong as of the moment. Um, with the exception of in 2012, where Mongolia rushed a law through Parliament to make it harder for China to invest in Mongolia, which is interesting. But other than that, yeah, it looks like China and Mongolia are doing doing all right right now, which is good for me, personally. Like I know that that's like the worst place to start this kind of like the sort of thing, but like being a person who aspires to research both Chinese and Mongolian history up to a point where China might maybe have a lesser opinion of everything, uh, knowing that their relation is is fairly uh, repaired at this point. Um, sort of helps make that helps make helps that research become easier for me in the future hopefully uh, assuming that I get to do that research but yeah so that's all we got Chinese Mongolian relations were well we didn't talk about pre invasion pre invasion China Mongolian relations were basically non-existent and this is because Mongolia wasn't uh, didn't really have a sense of being a nation for the longest time. Um, Mongolia actually only united as a unified, I don't want to say kingdom because that'd be wrong, it's, uh, it's not that far off, I suppose, um, state, we'll call it a state, that's wrong too, ah, Mongolia unifying as a unified force, is what we'll call it, uh, unified force, unified political power, didn't happen until the 11th or 12th century. Um, granted, China didn't actually unite into a unified power under Chinese government until the... F I want to say the 16th? It might have actually been as late as the 19th, but I don't think that's accurate. I'd have to double-check that. Basically what it boils down to is Mongolia united before China united, as far as I can tell. Um, China has always... Uh, up until relatively recently in the historical scale of things, been sort of patchwork, several kingdoms ruling over an area, and China itself wasn't actually considered its own sort of full empire, didn't even have a name outside of China until the 15th century, I want to say. Um, and even that's sort of a shaky, uh, shaky concept. But 
Uh, I'm glad anybody who stopped in to pay attention and check this out. Thanks for watching. Um, sorry about this last part where I basically don't play anything for a little while, but you're here for the history. You're not here for video games. That's a lie. You're probably here for video games. Whatever. Thank you for watching. Uh, next week, maybe we'll get back to Three Kingdoms, hopefully. Probably. Actually, we'll probably go. To, we'll probably we'll probably jump around a little bit. See, I've got some classes coming up where I need to do some research on the Crusades. So since I'm already doing research on the Crusades, might as well double dip a little bit. I know it's not like I know it's not a thing we usually talk about on this show. The Crusades is a little bit past the time, or uh, not past. Just the Crusades aren't the most interesting thing to me in that time frame. I'm more interested in what's going on in the eastern area of the world. East from a Western uh, Western perspective, yes, I know. But I'm more interested in what's going on in the Asian perspective than I am what's going on in Europe. But since I have to do the research on it anyway, we will probably talk about the First Crusade next week. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the People's Crusade because it's funny. Bad, but funny. So, hope you're excited about that as I am. Thanks for watching, and have a nice night, folks. See you around.